I wanted to ask you, you've dedicated a considerable portion of your professional career to endangered languages. Could you tell us what is an endangered language? An endangered language is when the children don't learn to speak the language anymore. The language of their parents, the language of their grandparents. And if they don't speak it anymore, the language of the ancestors, the heritage language, goes away and falls silent and we're losing the knowledge about this language. Mm -hmm. And this, this seems to be a phenomenon, of course it's a strong phenomenon here in Oaxaca, but it seems to be a phenomenon that's taking place around the world. Why is it that at this particular moment in history, language uh, displacement, language uh, obsolescence is so, so acute? What has happened over the past 20, 30 years is that the development, the globalization, urbanization and climate change has had a huge effect on all our lives. For some, it has been of advantage, right? Because you have access to technology, education, connection to major cities. But for others, it's a disadvantage. And what has happened in the same way that it has happened with our nature, we have changed the environment, we have introduced species that kill other species, some species can't live in the environment, and in the same way that our biological diversity is going away, the way that people live is changing dramatically, and it's changing at a dramatic speed. What happens is that people give up their traditional ways of life to have social and economic mobility to provide for their children, and they move to cities, for example, and they ensure that the child speaks the major language so that the child can have education. And they, people don't see the value in their ancestral or their heritage language anymore because it doesn't give them access to education or to better jobs. And this is happening globally. It's happening worldwide. And at the same speed where our nature changes, our lives change changes and we're estimating that um, at the end of this century of the 7,000 languages that are spoken today half of them will have fallen silent half of them will be gone and it means that people are in political and social situations where it's of advantage to give up their languages in favor for another language this is nothing new, this is a normal phenomenon. Languages change and shift all the time. Speakers adapt languages to their changing environment in amazing and beautiful ways. This is what we linguists are so um, marbled about and why we study it. Um, but the speed at which this is happening now, namely language shift, shifting from one to another and giving up the original language, we estimate is on the scale of a sixth mass extinction, like the fifth mass extinction when dinosaurs went. That is the speed at which it is happening now. And th the biggest disaster about it is that the majority of these languages are oral languages. They have never been written down. They have never been recorded. If we're lucky, we have you know, a grammatical sketch from many years ago. But what it means is that the rich knowledge about our cosmologies, about our heritage, about our nature, encoded in these languages, is vanishing without a trace. So, so what, would, what should be done? I mean, I imagine there's a number of things which could be done, but what would be one thing that we could do um, when faced with this, uh, this global situation? Well, this global, really disastrous situation in losing our linguistic diversity, the first thing that we need to do as a matter of urgency, and that has to happen quickly because languages are going every other week with the last speakers dying, um, is to at least to document them, to go out and to have linguists and anthropologists record these languages, work with the speakers, provide them with a record of their history and their heritage, their intangible heritage that is encoded in the minds of these elders. Um, that is one thing to do and these materials need to be kept safe. These materials need to come to a place, need to come to a digital archive so that the world can see and can know about the linguistic diversity that we have today and that will not be here anymore in 50 or 100 years. My personal history is reflected in the way things evolved. I'm 
Iranian by origin. I was born in Germany. My mother is from the Azerbaijanian region of Iran, speaking Azerbaijanian Turkish. My grandmother didn't speak any Persian. Um, my father is from the south. I grew up as a heritage speaker, speaking Persian at home. And if I would travel to Iran, I would, sp I would hear Azerbaijanian and speak Persian to my grandmother, who would speak Azerbaijanian to me. And then I lived in the Netherlands and in Germany and in the US and now I'm in London and my child speaks German and speaks English and doesn't speak a word of Persian. So you can see that you know, all these categories that we have actually don't apply to the majority of people, that there is one language, one people, one identity. Mm -hmm. We are a mix of everything and it's actually the multilingualism that is the beauty of our humanity and the skill set that we have that makes us so different from all other species. Mm -hmm. Now, you're now working as director of the Hans Rousing Endangered Language Project. What is that project and uh, can you tell us about it? What, it, what is its uh, mission? What, is it, what does it want to do? Yeah, so about 20 years ago, um, Lisbeth Rousing and Peter Baldwin um, heard about this crisis and had this vision that something needs to be done, that something needs to be done. And um, they funded the Endangered Languages Documentation Project at SOAS University of London so that linguists can get funds to do this work, to do field work in the most remote areas, to go with equipment and record this and to have the possibility to do this because this is not something that was strongly supported in the university and in our field of linguistics. They were very visionary in, in enabling this. And so in 2002, the program started with an academic arm to teach and to train in language documentation, with a funding arm to provide funds to documenters all over the world to go into Papua New Guinea, to go into Oaxaca and to record these languages, and then to preserve them in our digital archive in London. So this three-pronged approach has brought together so far, 380 funded projects with over 400 languages that have been documented and the resources are in our digital archive in London preserved for posterity. So that, you know, researchers can do research on, you know, origins of languages, families of languages, but also communities that would like to use materials to revitalize and to support more language work can use this material to create teaching and training materials for their local efforts in maintaining their languages and revalorizing this amazing skill that they have. Would, would uh, SOAS be open to collaborations with Mexico to make sure that this material is available to uh, communities here? We would love to, we would love to. We have done this work since 2002 and we have funded a number of projects here in Mexico. We have trained a number of scholars that work in Mexico and also Mexican community members that were collaborators of the scholars who have done amazing work. And we're holding this material in a digital archive in London. And that's just wrong. It should be in a digital archive, but it should be here. It should be in Mexico so that Mexican people can use this material, can host this material and can enrich it with their own sources. 